Hi, this is Greg from Structural Toolkit. And in this video, we're going to go through how to design a two-way slab in accordance with AS3600. A two-way slab design can be performed by using the two-way slabs and concrete member design module together. The two-way slabs module will determine the moments in a two-way slab panel, supported on all four sides, along with checking minimum strength requirements and deemed to conform deflection. The calculated moments can then be applied to the concrete member design module to check the design moments against capacities for positive and negative bending. In this video, we'll go through an example of a two-way slab that forms part of a suspended slab in a residential raft footing system. So for the first part of the design, we'll open up a two-way slabs module. Before we get into inputting some geometries and loads, it will be beneficial to first understand the main method used in this module for slab panel moment calculation. The method used comes from clause 6.10.3 of AS3600, which is the simplified method of reinforced two-way slabs supported on four sides. This section comes with a list of requirements, including having the loads be essentially uniformly distributed, so there can't be any significant concentrated loads. The corners have to be prevented from lifting, and there also can't be any openings that would adversely affect the strength or stiffness. The reinforcement needs to be arranged in accordance with clause 9.1.3.3, which is the deemed to conform arrangement for two-way slabs supported on beams or walls. It is important that any engineer using this module is aware of all the requirements before completing any designs. Another thing to note is that this module doesn't take into account any shear forces in the slab or the torsional effects created in the beams, particularly at the edge. AS3600 has various provisions regarding this, and so these will need to be referred to as required. The method to calculate the moments assumes a two-way rectangular slab supported on all four sides by either beams or walls. The slab panels can be continuous or discontinuous at each edge, and this will affect the calculated moments. The ductility class of the slab's reinforcement will also change the calculated moments. Low ductility reinforcement, for example mesh, does not allow for moment redistribution, whereas normal ductility class, i.e. bars, does, which is incorporated into the tables 6.10.3.2a and b. We'll have a bit more of a look at this in a moment. The first step of the method is to determine the positive design bending moments in the short and long directions in the middle of the slab span, being a function of three factors. The first factor is a beta factor, which is determined from one of the two tables in the code, being the two tables we were looking at earlier. And which one you use depends on whether the reinforcement is class N or class L. This is where moment redistribution comes into play and is represented in the values of each table. You can see this in action when the panel is long and the two long sides are discontinuous. The beta factor converges towards WL squared on 8, i.e. B equals 0.125 in table B, whereas in table 8 this is WL squared on 10 or a beta of 0.1. The second factor is then the uniformly distributed design load, FD. And then finally LX being the shorter span of the two-way slab. The negative moments are then calculated based on whether they are at a continuous or discontinuous edge, and also based on the reinforcement ductility class, which alters the table that is used. What you will then end up with are the design bending moments for the short and long span for the positive moment region, i.e. mid-span, and negative bending moments on the edges depending on the continuity. Something important to note that is if you're using class N reinforcement, then if a calculated negative moment on one side of a support is different to that of the other side of the support, the unbalanced moment can be redistributed in proportion to the stiffness span LX in the adjacent panels. This option is not possible for class L reinforcement. So now that we understand the way the method works, we can start inputting our example slab. For our residential slab, we'll use a typical 25 MPA and have the slab thickness be 130 mils. We'll say we want to design a slab that spans 4 meters one way and 3.5 meters the other. So put in 4,000 
and 3,500. These inputs will flip regardless of which cell you put the short or long length in. Next is our reinforcement class, which for a residential slab, we would be typically using a low ductility square mesh, such as SL82. So for our example, we will leave it as L. As for our continuous edges, we'll say we're designing a slab panel that is at the edge of our slab footing with three continuous edges and one discontinuous short edge, like we can see on this diagram. In this case, our inputs will be one continuous short edge and two continuous long edges. These options will then appear on the slab diagram in the module down below. Next, we can input our design loads. Our example panel is part of a residential house, so we will use 0.5 kPa of superimposed dead load to represent standard floor coverings, and then a typical live load of 1.5. If we were designing a garage slab panel, this might be zero superimposed and 2.5 kPa live load instead. For our live load type, we will keep this as normal, which will give us our side factors reflective of a standard floor loading. These can be seen in table 4.1 of 1170.0. The factors will get used for our deflection down below at the end. We will then get our ultimate UDL load with self weight included. This represents the FD value we saw before in the moment formula. Do note that having a live load that exceeds the dead load will bring up a warning as this is not permitted by the deemed to conform deflection method that we will have a look at later. The next section then covers the moment calculations that we went through earlier. And on the diagram we will see the positive and negative moments for each direction. We will use these moments later to check the bending capacity of our slab. In the notes to the right there is an option to use formulas to derive the coefficients if you're interested, but in the original derivation of the values in the standard. These use yield line theory and are applicable to normal ductility reinforcement only. These formulas are an extract from a Warner Rangan Hall reference. Next is the minimum strength requirements check, where the minimum reinforcement is calculated based on clause 9.1.1b, which provides a formula for slabs that are supported by beams or walls on all four sides. Do note that this method is based on the depth D to the bottom reinforcement with the cover specified below, which means we'll need to wait until we've input our reinforcement and cover before checking if this is correct. We will also confirm this in the concrete member design for top and bottom moment regions later on. The final section of this module is the deem to conform deflection. This method comes from clause 9.4.4.2 and is for rectangular slabs supported on four sides. It checks that the effective length to depth to steel is within a certain limit. The limit is calculated using a K4 factor, which is taken from table 9.4.4.2 being affected by the type of edge conditions and ratio of LY to LX. The limit calculation also includes an effective design service load, FDEF, which is either determined for total deflection or incremental, being the deflection that occurs after the addition of floor finishes. This is where our side factors are used. Within this service load is also a KCS factor that accounts for deflection due to creep and shrinkage and is calculated using the reinforcement that is in the compression zone of the cracked section and the reinforcement in the tensile zone. So for our slab, we'll be trying to use SL82 mesh top and bottom. So firstly, we'll put in our cover of 30. And then we'll select our mesh. This will populate the tensile steel and nominal bar size for our mesh. And then we'll also put our compression steel in as 227 as well. We can now see a warning appear, which tells us the compression steel is in tension. So it is ignored for our KCS calculation, which means it will calculate out to two. For our deflection limits, we'll want to refer to table 2.3.2 of AS3600. And for our total deflection, we will use span on 250 and span on 500 for incremental. So we'll input those values in here. The module will then calculate out the required depth of our member to be satisfactory by rearranging the effective length to depth to seal formula we saw earlier. To get a minimum thickness, half the bar plus the cover is added, which is what we can see to the right here. So for our 130 millimeter thick slab, we are okay. If we scroll up to the top, we can see this summarized.
That brings us to the end of all the checks in this module. In a real design, you'd likely also need to check a variety of other slab panels in your RALF system to deal with any cornice panels or longer internal panels. These different options will also give you different maximum moments for positive and negative regions. In our case, we'll stick with just this one panel. And what we can do now is note down our maximum positive and negative moments, and we'll then check it within the concrete member design module. In our case, we have a maximum positive moment of 2.6 kilonewton meters and a negative of 5.5 kilonewton meters. We can then open up a concrete member design. And first we'll check the positive bending. And so we'll name it slab positive. We'll then put in our 25 MPA, 130 millimeters for depth. Make sure you nominate two-way slabs so that the correct alpha B is used for the minimum steel calculation. As a side note, we can see that equation 9.1.1B is a simple rearrangement of equation 8.1.6.12 using an alpha B of 0.19. Down below, we can then put in our mesh, vessel 82 bottom and SL82 top. We'll also need to put our cover in as 30 for both. Next, we can put in our positive bending moment of 2.6 in the design action section. This will then be checked against the standard bending moment capacity calculation. Details on this can be seen in the detailed tab down below. If we scroll back to the top, we can see that our moment is well within capacity, along with a few other checks such as other methods of minimum steel calculation and cracking also being within the limits which follow clause 9.1 and 9.4 respectively. This module can also be used for checking shear as required. With our positive moment checked, we can then check our negative moment. What we could do is just change the moment in this document to be negative, but we will probably want to keep this design for later if it needs to be checked or printed out. So what we will do is copy it and then name the new version to be negative, like so. By doing this, we won't need to input all our geometry and reinforcement again. In here, we can then put in our moment of negative 5.5 and see that this also meets our negative bending capacity. With that done, our two-way slab design is complete. And what we'd want to do now is move on to our beam or wall design as required. That about covers all you need to know for designing a two-way slab in structural toolkit. Feel free to check out our website and our other videos for more tutorials and help with using this software. If you have any questions, please contact our support team via email or by calling us. Thanks for watching.